welcome everybody to today's FDTT Go 16 applications webinar. Today we're pleased to have uh, Jack Bevan leading our discussion along with uh, Mark DiMaria from the National Hurricane Center. Uh, their title of their presentation is NHC Discussion of Go 16 Imagery for Current Tropical Cyclone Activity. Just a quick reminder, all these uh, webinars are recorded and you can find them uh, at any time at, off the visit web pages at the URL shown below. Also, if you're interested in leading one of these in the future, we're looking for speakers, so just let us know. Just a little bit about uh, our protocol for today. We'll give about 20 minutes for our speaker and that'll be followed by a question and answer period of up to 10 minutes, so we'll definitely be done uh, by 17.30 UTC. Remember, don't press hold on your phone and also mute your phone when you're not talking. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jack Bevan. I'm one of the senior hurricane specialists at the National Hurricane Center. And I'm going to talk to you today about the use of GO-16 in our operations. Um, some parts of it we're still learning ourselves, so uh, there will be more to come with this uh, between now and the time the satellite becomes operational and between now and next year. But uh, give some examples of how we've already been using it in our operations and uh, look at some of the systems we've got going today and show some examples. Uh, first of all, our general area of responsibility at the Hurricane Center, we handle all the Atlantic tropical cyclones. As you can see here, we have an ongoing uh, tropical storm, now tropical depression, Emily, now in the Atlantic to the east of Florida, having crossed Florida yesterday and last night. We also handled the cyclones in the eastern Pacific uh, from the west coast of Central America out to 140 degrees west. And we have tropical depression Irwin, which is dying over cold water. And then area disturbed weather located to the south of eastern Mexico and Central America. As part of our operations, we use the satellite imagery, not just GO-16, but all sorts of satellite imagery to help us put out the tropical weather outlook products every six hours where we give a summary of the ongoing cyclones and a possibility of the a new cyclone formation during the next uh, two to five days. In the Atlantic at the moment, we're not expecting very much, although there is one interesting area of weather in the Atlantic I'll show you. And then in the Pacific, you'll see us reference this area of disturbed weather southeast of Tuanapec, and we're giving it a 20% chance of development in the next 48 hours and a 40% chance in the next five days. And that's based on a great variety of data. When we're looking at a, an advisory, we are looking for, to put the location of the storm, where it is, the motion of the storm, and the intensity of the storm, put in both terms of uh, pressure and winds. And because a lot of our other data sources do not have the reach to reach all parts of our basin, we rely quite heavily on geostationary satellite data. So I'll start with an example here. This is the GO-16 full disk. And let me slow this down a bit here so it does not uh, overload everybody's computer system and overload, but we're overload the network here. Uh, this is GO-16, the geo color from today, and it's highlighting a lot of interesting features. Uh, first of all, if you look over here off of Florida, it doesn't look particularly tropical because it looks like it's at the end of an old frontal boundary, but that is Tropical Depression Emily, which is still spinning out in that part of the Atlantic. And with GO-16, we can get five-minute, half-kilometer resolution imagery out on the forecasting floor of that uh, system. And out here further to the east is that other area in the Atlantic that I was alluding to. There's a tropical wave out here in the mid-Atlantic that has some signs of organization. The uh, computer models are not doing much with it at the present time, which is the main reason we don't have it in the outlook, but it certainly is generating an impressive amount of convection and making quite a hit, in the, not only in GO-16, but in the Meteosat satellite imagery as well. I will also point out here's another little ripple up here in the Gulf of Mexico from the same broad trough that helped spawn Tropical Storm Emily. 
Uh, most of the models are not showing a lot in the way of development with that, but they do agree that some sort of disturbance will move northeastward out of the Gulf of Mexico towards the Florida Panhandle over the next couple of days and perhaps bring another round of rain up there. At the moment, the chances of tropical cyclone formation on that system seem rather low, but uh, it's just one of the 65 to 100 systems we track every year um, in the Atlantic Basin. Out here in the Pacific, if you look over here towards the uh, edge of the picture where it just turned light, that little weak swirl there is the remains of Hurricane Hillary. And this swirl with decaying convection is Tropical Depression Irwin, which is also in the uh, process of decaying. Uh, there was some talk earlier in our forecast that the two systems are going to interact, and it may well come to pass, but it will probably be as they're both remnant low-pressure areas rather than actual tropical cyclones. Finally, if you look down here in the Pacific, this is our other area of disturbed weather, down here to the south-southeast of the Gulf of Tehuantepec. And even in this frame, you can see some rotation associated with that system uh, at the eastern end of this stretch of the intertropical convergence zone. And there is a significant chance this system will go on to develop further over the next five days as it moves towards the northwest or west-northwest off the coast of Mexico. Now, we will take this satellite imagery and interpret it in many different ways. And the one that we use the most for interpreting geostationary imagery is the Dvorak technique. And I could literally go all day talking about what the Dvorak technique is, but it, the basics are it is a method of estimating the intensity of tropical cyclones from satellite imagery, particularly visible infrared, and it includes a measurement of the cloud pattern in various ways and a set of rules. Now, it's based on imperfect correlations between the cloud pattern and the intensity, but it does work quite well, even with that. Uh, we do a manual version operationally. There's also automated versions that have been developed at places like the University of Wisconsin. It uh, has good track record, particularly with strong tropical cyclones, uh, a little bit less so on the weak systems, but it, it works very well on the whole. And there's a related technique not as rigorously defined for the subtropical cyclones. So this technique has been in use in one form or another since the 1970s. What we are hoping that with goes are, and it goes 16, we're going to refine it even further. Now, there is some work that needs to be done on this. And we actually had a case a couple of days ago with the Pacific system. The, some parts of the Dvorak technique, especially when we have a hurricane with an eye, like the pictures of Wilma of 2005 I'm showing you here, we are, we are getting the intensity estimate by looking at the uh, warm temperature in the middle of the eye and the surrounding cloud top temperatures. That's our basis for, estimate, for making this Dvorak estimate. We discovered the other day, or found at least one example, where the uh, cloud top temperatures for GOES 16 for this specific system were a bit different than GOES 15. Now, we expected some of this because the channels the infrared window channels on GOES-16 are not a perfect match for the ones on GOES-15, but this effect seemed to be a little bit greater than what we could explain by either the channel difference or maybe the viewing angle, since the, south, the storm in question was almost right under GOES-15 and considerably away from where GOES-16 is. So we're going to look at that. Other examples that we've looked at, the brightness temperatures, the cloud pattern that we're seeing in this infrared window channel, actually has matched up quite well. So we don't know why this particular one case was uh, different. But because it, it was a little different, we have to be a little careful, at least right now, of making some of these intensity estimates using the GO-16 data. But we hope to have this all straightened out in time for the next hurricane season. That's one of the, one of the parts of the learning curve of using the GO-16 data. Uh, visible data works very well, it's just that there are some parts of the technique using the infrared data where we'll have some of these head-scratching issues from time to time. For the most part, we don't expect we'll have to make big changes to our technique to match the GO-16 data. That's what some studies that Mark Maria and I and others had done over the years prior to the launch of GO-16. I should point out on this slide, GO-16 is, is delivering so much more than just the standard infrared, which is really 1970s level technology. We need to develop 
similar type of intensity estimation schemes using the more advanced, more detailed data coming from GO-16, that's not something that will be ready for this or next hurricane season. That will be several years of research and development but that will help better fully utilize the potential we're going to be getting with GO-16. I'll touch on a little of the, of the potential right now because I will go take a look at this multispectral imagery that we use operationally, the, the uh, red, green, blue, or RGB air mass product. We've been experimenting with this for many years using the Mediosat data, and now we're starting to get it with GOES-R. And what we're seeing here is areas where we have uh, green, for example, are deep tropical moisture, areas where it's this ochre color are dry, and areas where it's purple or, or, and pink over here are cold and it gets very red, it means there's stratospheric air intrusion. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and may take a moment for it to reload. Uh, this is Emily out here in the Atlantic, and you can see that white ball there is a convective cluster next to the center of the storm, uh, the depression. But you notice this ochre patch right here, right over the top of the circulation, which is centered right about in there. That is a patch of cooler and drier air over the top of the tropical cyclone associated with an upper-level trough, part of a uh, short wave that has moved through the uh, eastern United States trough. And this is given, uh, this combined with the fact that the system is embedded in a, what is essentially a long baroclinic zone extending from the North Atlantic down to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, suggests that Emily perhaps is not a fully tropical cyclone at this stage of its development. And indeed, our expectation is, given all the indications, it's going to merge with this baroclinic zone and become extratropical before it finally dissipates. But the, the fact that we can see this patch of drier and cooler air right here over the top of the tropical cyclone uh, is not exactly what you want to see if, if you're expecting further development as a tropical cyclone. Notice out of the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot more green out in this area, it's indicating deep tropical moisture. Probably this system will have better moisture and not as much cooler and drier air to play with, but it will have issues with shear, which is why it's not going to develop further. We have the other products that we can use on the, uh, on the RGB. So the other one we would use the most would be the dust product. I will bring that up here. In gory detail, it's not, we don't see a lot of vivid dust today, but this dust product is very good at showing not just areas of Saharan dust and aerosols, but dry air. It's very sensitive not only to the aerosols, but to uh, low-level moisture. And sometimes you can see dry lines and other boundaries between uh, moist and dry regions on this particular imagery. Um, in the visible imagery, I thought I could see a little bit of dust down in this area. If you look in here, there's a little hint of, of this pinkish color that's associated with the dust. In the eastern Atlantic, where you can see this, sometimes it gets very thick. It turns a very lurid pink. The red areas on this are the convection. It's using the short wave IR 3.9 micron. So the convection looks very speckly and noisy. Some of the mid-level clouds here show up in orange. The uh, warm ocean background is generally in blue, and up here you get uh, cold sea surface temperatures north of the Gulf Stream that show up in pink. They look like dry air. I'll point out here in the Atlantic, this is a little bit more uh, typical of what you see in the tropical Atlantic. You see a strip of pink here that's probably dust. And then uh, above the stratocumulus, you notice they all have that pink color. It means it's very dry above them, and that may inhibit the development of our next disturbance out here that we're watching at the present time. But we'll use this to help monitor the low-level moisture. We use the air mass product to help monitor the upper-level moisture and to make determinations of perhaps what kind of cyclone we're dealing with, an extratropical cyclone, a tropical cyclone, or some half-breed somewhere in between. Finally, to get to the really high-powered spatial and temporal resolution uh, capabilities that go 16, uh, we can get up to one-minute imagery. We actually took some one-minute imagery of Emily making landfall yesterday. We did not have that available for the webinar today. But this is from Hurricane Hillary last week. 
One-minute imagery showing overshooting tops going off of the eye wall. The center of the storm is right in this area. It does not have a well-defined eye at this time, but you can see the general convective curvature right in here and a little bit of a dimple. And the fact that we got all these overshooting tops going off right in this area, that's the eye wall convection right next to the, to the center of the storm. Um, one of the great uses for this imagery, maybe it's not watching the overshooting tops of the hurricane that much, but watching the animation of the low clouds, which you can see up here to the north and to the south, in other situations that can be very, very useful at finding the low-level center of the tropical cyclone, which is why what we're really trying to put in our advisory now. In a storm like Hillary, the two are uh, the upper-level center that we're seeing here, the surface center are usually pretty close together. But in other cases, we can have mid-level centers well away from where the low-level center is. And the ability that GO-16 will give us to watch both the high clouds and the low clouds. Uh, we saw this actually in Cindy. It was extremely useful uh, during early stages of Cindy's development. Uh, will let us better pinpoint the low-level center of action so we don't get led astray by some mid-level center that's well away from the actual surface flow position. And as I mentioned, with some of the other types of imagery, some of these microphysical channels, we still have a learning curve on that. We haven't quite figured out how to use those in our operations yet, but it can certainly tell us the difference between cirrus and ice uh, clouds and strong convection in a tropical cyclone. And eventually we can feed that back into our intensity estimates and probably into numerical weather prediction as well. So... With that, I'm going to run just a little bit under here. Are there any questions from the audience about anything I've mentioned here or anything that I have left out that you would like me to cover? Hi, Jack. This is Steve in Charleston. Um, have you folks uh, found any use for the Cirrus Channel uh, Band 4 yet? We have not fully found a use for that yet. Uh, we will, we're going to be looking at that because anything that can help us tell the difference between the convective ice clouds and the, and the lower, uh, low to mid-level clouds, there's still water we can certainly do something with, but it's not something we, we've used heavily in operations yet. We're kind of dabbling in it at the moment. So uh, it's one of the places we need to go. And that ice channel is one of those microphysical channels we need to make a better use of. Anybody else? Uh, Jack, this is Dan. Uh, just a quick comment maybe on the GLM. I know it's not in the AWEB sheet, oh. but how do you anticipate uh, using that? Okay, all right, that totally slipped my mind there, and thanks for the reminder. Um, the GLM is going to be, a, a, for us, an instrument with a very interesting learning curve. We anticipate, to some extent, we're going to use it very similarly, similarly to the lightning data we've been getting from Visala, which we would superimpose on top of the satellite imagery to help us locate convection in tropical cyclones. And uh, actually, it has a lot of use beyond tropical cyclone uh, convection as well. It helped us quite a bit in, in, in other convective identification areas like squall lines. And, for example, Aviation Weather Center, our office has some backup duties for them identifying convection for convective SIGMETs. Uh, the whole thing about lightning and tropical cyclones, though, is still a little bit... Uh, enigmatic or problematic, for lack of a better word, and th this is where the uh, GLM will be a learning curve. GLM will show us the total lightning that occurs in the storm, whereas before we've been seeing the cloud-to-ground lightning, which is probably representative of the most intense convection. We have found in some of our studies that if you get intense inner core lightning in a tropical cyclone, it usually means that the system is not intensifying much or it's just finished intensifying. And part of the reason for that is that some of our most intense convection occurs in sheared storms where we, uh, where we, the convection does not translate into much intensity increase, but yet turns into a very vigorous lightning producer. Uh, some of our more intense mature hurricanes actually have very little in the way of inner core lightning during the rapid intensification phase. 
Now, I think generally because Hurricane Matthew last year uh, kind of split the difference between that it had intense outer lightning, which is what we expect to see a rapid intensification case, and it did rapidly intensify, but it also maintained significant burst of lightning in the eye wall while it was undergoing uh, rapid intensification, which was kind of counter to the relationships that we had seen before. So uh, we'll see a lot more of this with, with the GLM. We will see... Uh, but probably a lot higher flash densities because we'll be getting the in-cloud and intercloud lightning to go along with the cloud to ground we've been getting through the ground-based networks. But there will still be some learning curve trying to turn this into a tropical cyclone diagnostic or predictive tool. Certainly it will help us locate the areas of the better convection, which in turn I think will feed back some into our locations because we'll know the storms have to be located near some, somewhere near where the strong convection is ongoing. But trying to turn it into something more diagnostic, we still have some work to do there. And Mark DeMaria is on the line. I'm sure he can comment more about that because he's done a lot of these statistical studies on the lightning. So, Mark, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, just just to uh, – you really summarized it pretty well. But the, for statistically, we feel like there is a signal there, but it's going to take a little bit of work to, um, to tease it out, particularly the inner core can kind of go either way. You can get a, a, a big outbreak of inner core lightning when you have vertical shear, or if you get a symmetric eye wall process, you can also get a, a big outburst of inner core lightning. So that one is going to take some work to make sure that we uh, uh, look at the signal correctly. The lightning in the rain bands is a little bit more straightforward. Generally, having um, lightning away from the inner core is, is favorable for intensification. That That's a pretty robust signal. But with total lightning, we really need to get some data under our belt to see how the cloud-to-ground studies relate to what we're going to see from the GLM. Okay. Any other comments or questions that anyone wants to go over? Yeah, hey, Jack. It's uh, Brian Mata. Could you say a little more about the um, mesoscale scanning the one-minute imagery and when uh, NHC would request that? Okay. Uh, the mesoscale one-minute imagery will be, I think, for us, uh, it's kind of special occasion sort of uh, situational special occasion. We requested, for example, yesterday during the landfall of Tropical Storm Emily. We uh, had this imagery that we're showing now on my screen from uh, Hurricane Hillary. Uh, there will also be other cases where we'll be using it, particularly in early morning situations, right as the sun is rising. We'll try to get a handle on, say, if we have an airplane scheduled to go out to a disturbance in the western Atlantic or the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico. We we'll want to get as much visible imagery as we can as soon as possible in order to uh, help us make a fly, no-fly decision on some of these systems. So there'll be sometimes we'll be requesting the, uh, the high-resolution scans even on weak systems just so we can uh, get quicker lo center location, assuming the center exists, help us determine if one exists and whether it will uh, be flown or not. We will also be trying, I think, some experiments eventually using the one-minute shortwave IR and the 10.3, uh, 3.9 channel combination that we uh, use so successfully with those 13, 15. We don't have those available yet, but we're working on that. We have, we have the one-minute shortwave if we need it, but we don't have the uh, channel combination available yet. Uh, but that would also help us in that decision-making and would lead into some of this uh, one-minute visible imagery in the early morning that I was that I'm talking about. And most likely we will ask for it during any major hurricane landfall, uh, just as we would ask for rapid scan during the, the previous landfall events. But it, it will have some uh, good purposes for us for... Generally use like Hurricane Hillary that we're seeing here might be a little bit of overkill, but there will be other situations where it will definitely not be overkill. Okay. Any, anything else? Thanks for the prompting on all this because a couple of these things slipped my mind. That's what happens when you're coming off of five midnight shifts. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Jack and Mark. Uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you.